Department of Energy Resources. And uh, so we'll go through, I'll go through a presentation generally. Uh, Mike Berry, who is a consultant with the Department of Energy Resources, will talk a little bit about the stretch code. Uh, we have, if there are questions, we have uh, somebody prepared to talk about the solar energy bylaw. And another person that's here is uh, Kelly Brown, who's our representative, our regional uh, director, representative or director? Oh, regional coordinator. Director. Regional coordinator. Oh, yeah. Director sounds good. Director sounds good for, uh, from the Department of Energy Resources. So without further ado, let's begin. In 2008, the Green Communities Act was brought forward by the state legislature under the encouragement of the governor with the purpose of encouraging energy conservation and to increase the supply of renewable energy in the state of Massachusetts, all toward trying to make Massachusetts more energy independent and lower the cost of doing business in Massachusetts. The Green Communities Act provides up to $10 million per year to help towns, municipalities, achieve energy reduction goals. So far, since 2008, 123 Massachusetts towns out of 319, is it? Have, <coughs> what? 351. 351. Have qualified as green communities, and they've benefited from over $22 million in grants. Medfield uh, would qualify for a $148,000 grant and be eligible for further grants on a competitive basis. So this is kind of why we're after this. Green community status would enable us to have $148,000 to be even greener than we are. Next slide. In order, so that's the carrot, $148,000 for us. The stick, such as it is, is to meet, you must have, you must meet five criteria to qualify for a green community. Number one is to provide siting for renewable energy. That means a place to either generate renewable energy, such as solar or wind, or provide a manufacturing facility for renewable energy or a research and development facility. That's one of the criteria. Number two, to enable the permitting for this to happen within, within one year so that a town would not be able to delay for a long time uh, providing that siting. Third uh, criteria is to develop a plan for reducing the municipal energy use by 20% over five years. That is to encourage the town to actually do something to reduce their energy uh, consumption. Number four would be to enact a policy for producing energy, for use, purchasing energy efficient vehicles. So again, to encourage the town to update their fleet of vehicles to reduce uh, the energy usage. And number five is to adopt a stretch energy code for new construction and renovations to reduce the life cycle energy costs in buildings. Now that sounds like a lot and we'll go into a little more detail on that. Next slide. I'll back up a little. The Medfield Energy was chartered by the Select Board in 2008 to assist the town in reducing energy usage by 20% over five years. So the town, the Select Board said, you people get together and help us reduce energy. Over the past five years, the town has realized energy savings of over $200,000 a year. The exact number of percentage is probably around 25%, but I don't have the exact numbers. But it's been very successful. The Energy Committee can't take the credit for that. It's really the people of the town that have worked hard. Mike Sullivan and all the departments have worked hard to reduce energy, particularly in the schools. The school energy consumption has gone down tremendously. We've gotten a lot of help from NSTAR with audits, our own Fred Davis has performed lighting audits, and there's been a lot of work by the town to reduce that energy usage. 
as we move on, the, Ed, the energy, Midfield Energy Committee is helping the town to determine the value of installing solar energy generation on town land and buildings. Fred Davis particularly has been uh, active in getting a grant so that we can have some studies done of town land to see what parts of the town, municipal properties, would be the best for example for putting in a solar farm. So we've done a lot of things to be green. Now what we'd like to do is become a green community and reap the benefits of that. Next slide. So of those five steps, those five criteria, step one and two will be covered. To achieve one and two of the Green Communities Act, a new zoning bylaw, Section 90, large-scale solar photovoltaic facilities overlay district, the POVD, has been drafted. It's been gone over several times, and it's been approved by the planning board. This bylaw, which will be Article 34 on the warrant at the April 28th town meeting, must be approved by two-thirds of the voters. So this is an important element. The overlay district is the industrial intensive district, which is the part of town north of West Street uh, in the northern, northern part of the town. I don't have, an, I don't have the uh, zoning map. You, ha you have it? Okay. We'll show, we'll show you the, where it is. Passage of this bylaw will also facilitate town plans to add solar energy generation and further reduce, which is the aim of putting solar in anywhere, is to reduce your energy bill. And we can do that for the town. The estimated return on investment is between 9 and 12 percent if the town elected to do it itself. There's also a proposal to have another company do it, and the town simply reap, reap the benefits. But to get there, we have to pass Article 34. So far, over 50 Massachusetts communities have passed solar bylaws, and 30 have large scale, which is over 250 kilowatt uh, solar uh, photovoltaic on town land. Norfolk's probably the one closest to us. They started up last year and it's been very successful for them. I'm not going to read through Article 34. This is the language that will show up on the warrant. Uh, it may be changed because we still have to talk to the warrant committee, but uh, the idea, of course, is to present to the town a proposal that this bylaw be adopted and become part of the town zoning bylaws. Next. To achieve step number five of the five criteria, it's recommended that the town adopt the Massachusetts Stretch Energy Code. This addition to the town bylaws, which will be Article 35 on the warrant, requires just a simple majority vote. <clears throat> Buildings account for 70% of the energy use in Medfield. This is the overall town, not just the municipality. This, of course, law, the Stretch Energy Code, will require new buildings and renovations be built to a higher standard than the current code. The aim of all of this, the increased cost of construction, will increase the cost of construction, but this increased cost results in a 15% to 20% lower energy cost of running a house, and the return on investment for that added cost ranges from 15 to 22%. Every house will be different. But the idea is these are things that's sensible to do because they have a good return on investment. So far, 134 Massachusetts towns have adopted this stretch energy code. And again, I'm not going to read through the dense language, but basically this says that we will adopt the stretch energy code, which is Appendix 115AA of the Massachusetts Building Code dash 780 CMR, including future additions, amendments, and modifications thereto. So on the start date would be January 1st, 2015. Um, go on. Just to put it in perspective, 
This is an example of a large home. The added construction cost to meet the stretch code from the current code would be about $6,462. The energy savings would be $1,455 a year. That gives you a return on investment of 22%. It would increase your mortgage by $471 a year. So the builders will say, gosh, we don't want to do this because it costs more. But as an owner, it costs you less because $1,455 minus the $471 added mortgage payment, you're still saving almost $1,000 a year in energy per year, every year. Next slide. An average home, 2,600 square feet, more or less. The added construction cost is $3,000. The energy savings is $500. Return on investment of 17%. And again, you add to your mortgage, but the annual net savings is almost $300 a year. Again, it's not something the builders want to do. But as a buyer and as a homeowner, you would want them to do it. If they would take, if, if we could get people to take as much time selling the idea of an energy efficient home as putting in granite countertops, we might have a better uh, environment for ourselves. The third, third one, this is for a smaller home. Added construction costs and meat code 4,162, but the energy, which is higher, and you say, why is that? This example was an existing home. So it started less energy efficient than the current code. So you can see the effect. This is almost like a renovation. You get a higher return. You're, you're, you're spending more, but you're getting a higher return. 14% are return on investment. Annual net savings about $281 a year. Next slide. So I've covered one, two, three, and four. The first two steps are with the first uh, Article 34, and the second and number five is with Article 35. We plan to you <clears throat> to fulfill criteria three, a plan to reduce municipal energy use by another 20% because we've already achieved 20% from a 2012 base because as you apply, you can only go back two years for uh, the Department of Energy Resources. It'll be developed over the summer for approval by both the select board and the school committee. Both committees have to approve this because it requires them to actually take some action. Second, a policy to purchase Energy efficient vehicles is, it's almost written. We have the inventory. It'll be completed by summer for approval by the select board and school committee. By the way, this is energy efficient vehicles that are not in an exempt class. All the vehicles that are on the Department of Public Works, emergency vehicles, police vehicles, heavy duty vehicles are exempt from this requirement. So you're really talking, I think, in Medfield, about six vehicles, is that? School cars and so on, but not buses. So the plan is for Medfield to make applications to the Department of Energy uh, Resources for a green community status in the fall of 2014. And if we're successful, uh, 2015, we should hear how we did. Next. So we're asking you to do your part, which is the Medfield Energy Committee and the Select Board urge your support of the Green Communities Initiative. The Planning Board supports the solar photovoltaic bylaw, Article 34. And if the stretch energy code is adopted by the town, the building commissioner is prepared to administer to the new code. So. Uh, we ask you to attend the annual town meeting and vote in favor of these two articles. Now we have some further information available on both the stretch code and the solar bylaw.
But right now, I think I should pause for questions. Um, one of the concerns that I, I had heard people talking about was that when you sign up for the stretch code, you're signing up for future amendments that we're not yet aware of. And I was wondering how we might understand what the risk and concerns of that might be, or if there are none. One, just, just one thing, as you saw from the previous uh, results of the stretch code in terms of return on investment, one of the commentaries to the people that are developing the new stretch code is please maintain that 15% return on investment as kind of a criteria so that people aren't forced into spending money that doesn't have a return on it. Um, you're correct. The stretch code will change eventually. Uh, currently, right now, the base code, the base energy code here in town, IECC 2009, is going to change on July 1st of 2014. As that code rolls out and actually becomes uh, implemented throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the state is going to take feedback from communities that have already adopted the stretch code and also what's going on with the current base code and determine the next level of stretch code. Whether the stretch code is 15 or 20% more energy efficient as it is now to the base code is yet to be determined, which is true. But what we're going to find out is where the stretch code needs to be. But just as towns have the right to vote in the stretch code, the town has the right to remove the stretch code as well as the new one rolls out. So that does affect your, the caveat there is it does affect your green community status. But a town does have the right to vote out the stretch code as it, a new one comes out. With that being said, the current stretch code that your town's looking to adopt is very similar to the code that's coming out on July 1st of this year. The next version of the stretch code is going to look a lot like the next code that's going to come. So basically, a town adopts a stretch code is adopting the next version of the code prior to the code being base code in Massachusetts. So I guess my, my comment to that would be a town can either adopt it and make it their stretch code and get rewarded for it and be a green, communities and a green community and also get funding, or they can wait till it becomes state law and then basically get nothing for it. So um, it is moving the market and it's moving builders and builders are nomadic. There's a lot of towns when I do my presentation, I'm gonna do a very quick presentation. I'm gonna show the 134 communities and a lot of builders are working in towns that already have the stretch code. So we're seeing less and less builders concerned about it but we are having people ask questions about the next version. But we are going to be soliciting feedback across the Commonwealth for folks to let us know. And now that we've done the stretch code since 2010, we've had the stretch code, we really now have a better sense of where the next stretch code may need to be. But we have to let the new code roll out. So I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, Jeff Hyman. I I think this is great. I mean, I support this. Medfield is a smart town, and this is a smart thing to do. Um, the builders, you said builders, you know, are sort of reluctant. And I guess I'd like to know specifically what, what are they reluctant about? If an owner is going to almost immediately benefit from it, what is, what is that barrier as far as builders are concerned? Um, I think one of the biggest barriers or one of the biggest concerns we are faced by builders with a stretch code is two things. One, um, there's two ways to build a home in Massachusetts. There's the performance path and the prescriptive path. The performance path allows a builder to work with a HERS rater. They have trade-offs. They can kind of pick and choose to see how a home will perform and meet the code. And then there's the prescriptive, which is basically follow the code to a T. It's like following a, a, a recipe to make a cake. As long as you follow it to a T, you're going to bake a cake. Most builders in Massachusetts have only built homes through the prescriptive path. So a town that adopts the stretch code, you remove the prescriptive path from new construction. So the only way the builder can build a home is through the performance path. What does that mean? As Fred mentioned, you're getting a higher performing, better performing home that has the opportunity to save a lot of energy based on its performance. And it's not just performance based on what the code said it's going to do. It's based on actual performance. The reluctance with builders is, how do you sell that to a homeowner? So if Medfield were to adopt the stretch code, how's a builder going to say to a homeowner, Medfield's a stretch code community, and although the base code is this, I have to go 
more energy efficient. And there is a cost to that. But being able to educate builders on the payback is going to be a big benefit. And that's why we've done, uh, we've done several informational sessions here in town. Your code official's done a great job getting information out. I think also because he's got a background in this. He worked in a town that has the stretch code. And this is coming. So this is a good opportunity. The next version of the code is going to be more performance-based. The state and across the country, we're moving more towards performance-based codes. So people are going to need to know how to do this. So whether builders are learning now in a stretch code community or when it becomes base code, they're going to need to know how to sell performance and sell a more energy efficient home. So it's, it's education. And it, it starts with everyone from bankers to realtors to homeowners to, and it's also the demand from homeowners wanting this, moving past the granite countertops. Other questions? Thank you. I'm curious, we're probably looking at a major development project up on Hospital Hill. To what degree would this uh, stretch code have on that coming to uh, fruition and, and moving forward? <laughs> you, you don't want to? <laughs> well, I'm actually going to put you on the spot, though. Yeah. Uh, By the way, this is John. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess the question is, has it been permitted yet? Not yet. Okay. Not yet, but it's going to be permitted probably before July 1, so there'll probably still be another 2009. So that's the big thing here, is you saw um, on the article, um, if I can go back real quick. Um, oh, nope. I think it was right here where it says that the stretch code would be adopted on January 1st, 2015 with a sole effective date of July 1st, 2015. Anything permitted between now and January 1st, 2015 would fall under the base code. So it would be exactly the same as across the straight state. Between January 1st, 2015 and July 1st, builders would have the de could decide to either build to the stretch code or the base code. But then after that, on July 1st, 2015, the only way you can build it's a stretch code. So it should have no effect on as long as they're permitted prior to the effective date of the stretch code. And even if it did, it's most likely commercial controlled construction. And it has to adhere to the uh, commercial building code, which is controlled construction. Con uh, commercial builders tend to work with energy engineers. The stretch code requires a commercial building to be 20% more energy efficient than the commercial building code. And I can speak a little bit to this, but maybe John can as well. Most commercial builders don't have an issue with that, um, where they just say, they'll say to the engineer, I have to be 20% better than code, get me there. So. Yeah, I think it would be a wise decision to you know, yeah. just, just go there. Go there on one. Don't try to make two cuts. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so January, I'm sorry, July. It takes effect July 1, 2015, which I would assume that our commissioner will be flooded with lots of building <laughs> permits. Um, what, what, may, what seems to make sense, is there a requirement or couldn't, could there be, this educational piece seems really interesting to me. Instead of people rushing in and saying, you can do this now, there almost should be a requirement in the system that says the, that potential homeowner or that person that is going to enter into a project should be given materials and, and that builder or somehow should have to show them this difference so that you can say, here's your choice because I, unless I'm missing something, there's, there's a no-brainer going on here. If people are first cost sensitive, they need, I'm sorry, you know, they just, they don't get it. They just don't get it. So how do you require that? I'm sorry. John? No, well, like Fred, like Fred said before, um, if, if people, everybody wants stainless steel appliances, everybody wants granite countertops, but yes, if you stopped and looked at um, what your energy cost is going to be for your new home later on, a home builder now uh, building a spec home, no, he's not going to build because it's money out of his pocket, but yet if you're having a home built, yes, you can say, hey, I want to build my home more efficiently. By all means, he would need to meet that. But yeah. Sorry, playing musical mic. Um, 
you talked about first cost. And when Fred put up this slide, this is an existing home. This is actually a triple decker. And when you see the added cost to construction of $4,162, compared to a brand new home with less additional cost, that's because it always costs more money to go back and fix a problem than it does to do it right the first time. But you bring up a good point, and it's something we've talked about, and maybe Kelly can speak to this. You could use your green communities funding to educate consumers. Kelly and I just did a, a stretch code informational session in Pepperell, and one of the arguments to not adopt the stretch code or adopt, become a green community is every town around them is a green community and is this gonna hurt our community because someone's gonna go, well, I was thinking about moving to Pepperell, but they're not a green community, but every other community around them, so what's Pepperell not doing? Like, you know, so we've heard it, and so maybe educating people what having the stretch code means to them and why it's beneficial and why it'd be beneficial to do it during the concurrency period would be uh, important as well. So one thing is you're seeing the numbers up here, so this is making sense to you. The average person doesn't always see this when they're building a house. They're thinking, well, this is $3,000, but how does that play out and looking forward to it? So it's getting used to reduce, reduce life cycle costs. So it's, I like to compare it to talking to my mom and saying, you know, thinking now for retirement. So you're thinking of the initial money you're putting up and then what you're going to get paid back over those years. So it makes sense when you look at it, but it's getting builders to pass on that message and then for everyone to know about which is the education piece. I'm just curious, are the, the real estate agents of, you know, behind this uh, effort? I hope so. <laughs> we had a session last week just for builders and developers to talk specifically about the stretch code. Uh, the turnout wasn't as great as tonight, but we did have people here that were curious about it and interested in it. So, and, broke, and a couple of brokers. was in the room. Um, yeah. Um, I think it was a representative from Century 21 or Prudential. I'm not certain. I have, I have a card. But as I was leaving, to answer your question, she said, we sell homes now in stretch code communities. And this is important for me to understand the difference of why a home being built in a stretch code community is different from one not being built. So I can use that as a way to sell a home. And Fox 25 on there their little round robin trips they do every Friday in the summertime when they go to different communities, they travel with realtors. And the realtors in the town will highlight some homes. And I can't remember the town they were in. I think it was like Stoughton or something. It was one of the communities that had adopted the stretch code and adopted, was a green community. They not only said these townhomes are built in a green community, but they're built to the stretch code, which means they're 15% at a minimum more energy efficient than a townhome in the next town over. So. I think realtors are becoming more savvy about it, but I think like when it first came out, when the stretch code first came out, it came out just on the heels of the state trying to get uh, a bill passed where all, all homes, all existing homes had to have an energy audit done. And I think this kind of got lumped in there, but now when what realtors are finding, which communities are finding, one of the biggest misconceptions when we first started going and talk about the stretch code is everyone thought once the town adopted the stretch code, every home in town had to be brought up to the standard. Once the realtors realized it only affected new homes, renovations, and additions, just like the regular base code would, I think it, it made a big difference when they realized it wasn't going to affect the existing home market. So, Yeah, Massachusetts uh, Climate Action Network looked around at different communities to try to find if there was a difference between a community with stretch code and a community without stretch code in terms of is the number of building permits been depressed because of it or have the sales been depressed because of it and they found the opposite that the communities that had adopted the stretch code and gone that extra step actually had a little higher sales and were issuing more building permits so go figure you know we also have a member in the audience that had a home renovation or addition that you had to meet the, oh, okay. Any other questions? Perhaps you could quickly do uh, 
your bid on the stretch code, it particularly show the communities around us that have adopted. Um, <clears throat> so then I'll do what Fred wants. Um, <laughs> So I'm not going to spend a lot of time because Fred did cover a lot of the points, but what I did want to bring up, um, we do have this slide presentation available for people that would like to see the, the full presentation. Um, but I mentioned this early on, that right now in your town, you have the International Energy Conservation Code for 2009. That's the base code here in Massachusetts. Any builder right now going to pull a permit and it's going to affect the the uh, energy code is going to pull it under this. The stretch code is 15 to 20 percent more energy efficient than this on the residential and 20 percent more energy efficient than the base code on the commercial side. As I mentioned early on, the uh, current stretch code we have looks a lot like this code, uh, this, the next version of this code, which we're going to have starting on July 1st of 2014. The stretch code, as, as Fred mentioned, is an appendix to the base energy code and the mass general codes, that 780 CMR that Fred mentioned. This is part of the code. So an early misconception we had when we were, run, when we were first going out and introducing the stretch code in 2010 was, well, it's not state law. And I don't need to follow it. And it's a town by town adoption. It's not consistent. It's part of the code book. So every builder who is a current licensed builder has a copy of 115 AA. Um, and if they don't, they should. So I mentioned that. One of the misconceptions, the stretch code was ex new and experimental. It's based and rooted in the next version of code. So the next version of code that we're getting July 2000, the July 1st is the IECC 2012. They've actually already written IECC 2015. So we know what the next code is going to look like. It's not s finished yet, but we know where it's going. And Massachusetts will adopt the next version of the I codes because we want a consistent code. It's the same code used in other states, but it's, uh, it's got some climate deviations. But instead of having to write a code, why not use a code that's already out there and, and flushed out? Uh, that the stretch code requires tight and unhealthy homes. In fact, it's the opposite. Because the stretch code requires home builders to work with a, a home energy rater, they address indoor air quality. So instead of just going out there and tightening up a home and not having an address, not seeing that the home's too tight and needs ventilation to be added right here, you have someone doing that work. That the stretch code requires foam insulation, that's not true either. You can get there by using other insulation types. What the stretch code allows you to do is it's a performance-based code. Again, you remove the prescriptive path. The performance base allows you to pick and choose where you want to put things in. One of the big things right now on the base code here in, in town is if you want to pull a permit and to build a new home here or put an addition on your home, your lighting, 50% of the lighting you add would have to be high efficacy lighting. So we have a lot of people out there say, I don't want LEDs, I don't like the light color, I don't want CFLs, I don't like the way they work. Under the current code, the base code, you would have to install those. Under the stretch code, you wouldn't because you would have the option to then beef up your insulation, put in better windows, put in better mechanicals. It's a performance-based code, so you, can, you have what they call trade-offs. And last, I mentioned it earlier on, is that, uh, that towns, town residents were really concerned about updating their existing homes. That's not a requirement. Only things that would affect the, uh, the energy code. So if you're putting a kitchen in, you're remodeling your kitchen, you're not opening up any exterior walls, you don't have to meet the stretch code. Second you open up a wall and there's, there's no insulation, there's little insulation, just as the base code would require you to fill that cavity with the max amount of insulation it can hold, the stretch code will do the same. So there's not many differences. So a lot of people would say, oh, you know, I'm concerned. If I'm going to remodel my kitchen, remodel my bathroom, I'm going to have to bring my whole, code, my whole home up to code. That's not the case. Only the things that would trigger the energy code. And I do want to say lastly that homes with oil heat can't meet the stretch code. That's actually not true either. When I show you the map that Fred was mentioning, you look at the number of towns in Western Mass that actually adopted the stretch code, that there is no gas service. But the way they got there, again, trade-offs. You put more insulation in your house. You wrap your house like you're wrapping it with an extra blanket. So you don't need a more efficient heating system because you might not be able to get it with oil or um, 
other types of deliverable fuels. I'm not going to get into the five criteria. Fred already covered the five criteria and how the stretch code plays into that. Um, why towns are adopting the stretch code? Well, obviously, again, in Fred's presentation, he talked about the municipal grants, but some towns wanted to do it because they wanted to, to decrease their dependence on imported fuels, their concern about pollution and climate change. But the other thing, too, is a lot of towns were coming to the state and saying, I want a more stringent energy code. And towns were lobbying to get a better and more energy efficient code than the base code. And what the state decided to do is come up with Appendix 115 AA. Before that, it was 120 AA. But they wanted to have a code that was an alternative, but a consistent alternative. So builders who are working in a town where there is this alternative code, and they go to another town where that alternative code is, it's not a totally different code. So even though one of the big misconceptions early on was it made for an inconsistent energy code, it allows for consistency so there's an alternative code for towns that want to do something different and go a little deeper with energy savings. So here's the map. I always get to feel like a weather person when I do this. But mm -hmm. you can see here in the greater Boston area, you see the most amount of towns that were early adopters too to the stretch code. So towns back in early on, the two early adopters were Cambridge, and Newton, they adopted the code back in 2010 when we had another base code. So the code they actually adopted was two generations away. So they actually took the hit early on. So towns like your town, Medfield, have the ability to take a code on that's gonna be very similar to the code you're getting on July 1st. True, we don't know what the next version of stretch code is gonna look like, but we do know that it's gonna be more energy efficient. Um, and as you see more towards Western, Ma West Western Mass and in Pioneer Valley, a lot of towns out there that don't have gas service have adopted the stretch code and homes are being built there. We also find that in Western Mass, builders tend to be a little more progressive because the fact that they're either heating with oil, wood, pellet stoves, and they need to have a more efficient shell, they can't get there with, with, uh, with getting better and more efficient gas uh, heating equipment. So what does the stretch code apply to? It applies to the same thing as the base code. So anything that would trigger, uh, again, uh, address the energy code. So whether it's insulation, doors and windows, you know, lighting, uh, building tightness, even renewable energy, all factors into the stretch code. Same with the base code. What does it apply to on the residential side? Any additions, home renovations, and new construction. And on commercial buildings, new construction additions, and if you're renovating a commercial building, it, it's exempt. There's also a historical exemption under the residential. If you had a building that was deemed historical by his, uh, the historical charter, an historical district, that building would also be exempt. What makes the stretch code different, I mentioned early on, is under the residential code, additions and home renovations are very similar to the base code. The big change is under new construction. I mentioned about the performance and prescriptive path. You can do the performance and prescriptive path on additions, home renovations, and new construction under the base code. Under the stretch code, you remove the prescriptive path from new construction. So it's no longer an option. So when you ask the question early on, what's the reluctance to builders? The reluctance to builders is that it's a whole new way to build if they've never done performance path construction. I can guarantee you, though, for the most part, once a builder's done performance path construction, they very rarely go back to doing prescriptive. So in additions and renovations, under the prescriptive path, it's very similar to the base code. The only difference is it's going to require you to put in Energy Star doors and windows and skylights when you remove one. So you take a window out, you have to put in an Energy Star window. The state building code says that a window needs to be a 0.35 U value. An Energy Star one is 0.30. It's very rare to see anyone put anything that isn't an Energy Star window. Doesn't mean that they don't do it, but the stretch code does require that you have a better window installed under renovations. And again, it's only if you remove one, you have to put a better one in. Tighter ducts, you have to do that under the base code. So it's not much different. And then contractor verified thermal bypass checklist. All this is is a checklist for builders. They check it off themselves and it aligns in the code book with all the areas to make sure a home performs as it should. It addresses how insulation is installed, how homes are air sealed, and where the leakage is occurring. It actually just identifies the key junctions where builders 
and insulation contractors need to seal up the shell. Lastly, under additions and renovations, just under the base code, the same thing, they can do a performance path. But when you look at this example of a house, if this house was built in 1950, it's had no other things ever done to it, and you put on this addition, this addition, same as the base code, has to meet the current code. But then with the performance test, performance path, you would end up testing this whole house. And guess what? You're probably not going to get there without doing major renovation. But if you were putting on an addition and renovating this whole house, maybe you would do the performance path because you would have the ability to do trade-offs. So this is something that builders would, would have to also determine. But currently under the base code, they have this, this option. So this is not new for them. Under the home, uh, under the new homes program, again, the only way you can build a home is performance path. What, that, what does that mean? It means they have to meet a home energy rating standard. I'm not gonna get into too much what the home energy rating standard is, but what I can tell you is it's an energy gauge, uh, let's say an energy yardstick. Um, I use the example that my house built on the Cape, was built in 1830, and when I did the first, when I bought my house, it was 240 on the HERS index. It had no insulation, had old windows, bad heat. I put better insulation in, sealed up my house, drove the consumption down. I drove it down to like a 180. But what did that mean to me? It meant I was using one less tank of oil a year, which when I bought my house at 89 cents a gallon wasn't a big deal. But when oil jacked up to $4 a gallon, it was a huge deal. This was actually created by the um, energy efficiency mortgage industry because they were used to give out energy efficient mortgages. And what they want to know is, was their investment on a house like mine of X number of dollars going to yield like Fred was showing you, the payback, the life cycle cost analysis. So they came up with the home energy rating index. Problem was, this came out when energy costs were nothing. So no one took advantage of an energy efficiency mortgage. So the HERS index actually got to, to see the light once again and became actually part of our code. So this HERS index has been referenced in the code book, I think, since the sixth edition of, of the Mass State Building Code. So this is, again, it's, it's not new to the builders. The process is new. The terminology's there. But what ends up happening with a HERS rating is you work with a HERS rating company, which, again, is a subcontractor to the builder. So one of the early things we heard from builders was, is there enough HERS raters? Well, yes, there is. Is what happens if a HERS rater doesn't show up to do my inspection? They work for you. You just don't pay them. It's like having an electric, electrician on, on site or a HVAC contractor. The HERS rater works for you. What the HERS rater does is they review your plans. They run them through a software program. That software program tells you where this fall, your house falls on the HERS index. As long as it meets that standard over there, when you come in and pull a permit, John's going to say, let me see your HERS rating, your initial plan review. As long as it hits a 65 or 70 based on its size, he's going to hand you a permit and you're going to start building. Then during the process, he's going to come out and do all the same inspections. And now the HERS rater is going to come out and they're going to also do inspections. So now you have two sets of eyes on the house. Lastly, they're going to be doing performance testing. They're doing the blower door test. So if you've ever seen that done, that's a whole house leakage test. They put a big fan in your house and draw all the air out, and they're going to see how badly it leaks. And hopefully it doesn't leak that bad, because the tighter it is and the better it performs, the better the score is. Little thing about blower door and duct testing I just want to talk about is under the current code, every home has to have a duct test onto it. Unless, as long as the ducts are, are what they call outside of condition space, but this is part of the code. The IECC 2012 that we're getting on July 1st is gonna require every home to have a blower door test on it. So again, stretch code is just the next version of the code you're, you're basically adopting prior to it rolling out. So builders that have never had blower door testing done, starting on July 1st, every house will have to have a blower door test done if it's permitted after July 1st, 2014. So this is coming. So this is, no, this is, this is the thing I say to people. It's either you're, you're right beyond the turn or you're going to be before the turn. But the next version of code that we're going to see is going to require performance testing. It's going to, you're going to need to hit this target. Um, and that's probably the 2015 code. So I mentioned that the HERS index is used for the Internal Revenue Service. 
as a way that used to give um, energy uh, rebates for, um, for taxes. It's used by the Department of Energy. It's used by the EPA Energy Star Homes Program. It was used by the mortgage industry. It's been part of the alternative path for the base code here in Massachusetts. And there's a program out there through the owner investor utilities and Star National Grid, um, all the utilities and energy efficiency providers that make up the Mass Save program, where there's money out there through ratepayer funds. So anyone that pays into a utility bill pays into this, where there's money that can put up to $7,000 for a single family home into your pocket. So the numbers that Fred was showing you were numbers that I don't believe actually those included that. No. Yeah, so these are, as long as you're building where there's an owner investor utility, you are eligible for these funds, whether it's the builder that applies, the homeowner applies, the architect. So these here will help offset that cost. So there's ways to help builders, but again, it goes back to education. We need to be able to educate uh, builders on where the resources are and where the money is to help offset some of these costs. I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, I'll just touch really briefly about the commercial stretch code. It affects new buildings and additions only over 5,000 square feet. Unlike the, prescript, unlike the residential code, there's a performance path which says you gotta be 20% below code and a prescriptive option. So there's two paths for builders uh, of commercial projects. Um, there are some exemptions to the rule. There's special exemptions for certain building types, uh, buildings that might be used for pharmaceuticals and labs and warehouses. Um, but basically, I mentioned early on, companies don't have a, a challenge with this because they're already doing performance-based um, and they're doing energy analysis on their building prior to them building because they have to. Um, so say to them, drive it down is, is not a challenge, but for a homeowner, I mean, a home builder that's never done performance path construction, it, this is the big hurdle for them. Um, and I'll just get on a, a, another return on investment. Uh, this is a commercial building, so when Fred mentioned early on that even though it won't be code for that project that you mentioned in town to do this, it may, they might want to. So this building is the Fidelity Bank building in Lemonster, Mass. It's right, you can see it right off Route 2. It was built in the early 2000s. Lemonster is a stretch code community. But they didn't, um, they didn't build it under the stretch code. They, just, they were building it under their base code. Fidelity knew that this building was going to be a high consumer of utilities. And so what they did is they sat down with their energy engineer and said, we want to see where we can improve this building. The engineer looked at the HVAC equipment, the lighting, and the building envelope came up with about $100,000 worth of um, shell improvements and upgrades. The utility companies gave $66,000 incentives back, bringing the net owner cost of only $34,000 out of pocket, and their first year energy savings was $27,000, making their return on investment with those utility incentives of 1.2 years. Without them, it would have been 3.7. So from even a bank, this was a wise financial move. So even though it's not going to be code for that project, this might be something that the builder might want to look into because it is a commercial pro project and there's a lot of utility money out there to do so. Um, code compliance inspection, I mentioned same as the base code. Your code official still has the same um, authority. They approve all the documentation. They still go out and do the same inspections. Again, Having someone out there, the third party verify the HERS rater allows for another set of eyes to go out and inspect the project. It also helps the builder and allows the builder to have an energy guide. Someone is gonna walk them through the energy process and they don't have to be the energy expert. They can have the HERS rater who's gonna be the energy expert. Uh, and to your question, the future of the stretch code, it will update in 2014 it probably will be late in the year. We know the new code comes in, comes in in July 1st and we're gonna wait and we're gonna receive public comment and feedback. We know it will be more efficient. And again, towns will automatically adopt it unless they decide to vote it out. It will automatically become your base code. 
if towns like Newton adopted the stretch code, what, back in 2010, 2012, so there's a new stretch code coming out, do they have to go back now to their population and readopt, or they just automatically? Uh, the code that they adopted in 2010 is still the current code, and it's the same code that right now um, Medfield would adopt. But w when the new code does roll out, if Newton decides that they don't want to make any changes, they'll automatically adopt it. But they will have the, they will know what they'll be able to review what the new code looks like, and they'll have to make a decision if they decide to want to remain a green community and also keep the stretch code. So the warrant article language that uh, Fred mentioned earlier has language in it that says future additions. So that's why they just automatically go to the new. Yep, that's why it goes to the new edition of it, unless, as Mike pointed out, that you chose to unadopt it at town meeting. Are there any other questions, any comments? I think the public safety building that is being uh, designed right now for the town of Medfield, that is being built to the stretch code. So the permanent planning building committee think it's a good idea. Yeah. Our new town garage is, seems to be conveniently located next to the old landfill, and I was just curious if a solar array could be related to powering that at some point. Well, there are two things about the town garage. It doesn't have solar panels on it, but it's supposed, the structure is supposed to be ready for it. The Midfield Energy Committee has been talking quite a bit about the town landfill as a site for solar energy because so many towns in Massachusetts have put solar uh, farms on their old landfills. We have to do a study, and Fred is in the process of uh, vetting company, getting uh, requests for proposals from companies to do that work for us. So it'll it'll be a while, but it's certainly something we we see as well. Any other comments? Well, I really appreciate everybody coming out. I uh, sure. Hi, I'm Marie Nolan. I'm also on the Energy Committee. Uh, and I prepared a, a short, it won't be very long, I know you guys have been great, um, but I thought that people would also would like, be interested in knowing what was in the solar bylaw that we uh, drafted. So um, I have a few slides to talk about that. So next. Um, just the first comment is that it is a wave of the wave of the future. Uh, there's a new aggressive state goal of 1,600 megawatts installed uh, solar PV capacity by 2020. The state had a, a goal, um, you would know, uh, Kelly, of in, uh, for 2017, and it was met already. So then they said, okay, let's even make a, a more difficult goal to attain because Massachusetts is really going great guns in, in having uh, solar energy. And uh, there's, a, there's a couple of uh, databases out there that you can uh, see ex exactly how many uh, PV installations, this is actually for homes too, it's not just commercial, that's why the number is so large. But there's 10,000 installations in Massachusetts and some uh, 400 are larger than the 250 kilowatts. And that's the, that's the definition for a large scale solar array and that's what this, uh, our, um, our bylaw is addressing, large scale solar arrays. And as uh, Fred had said earlier, that the, uh, a number of communities in Massachusetts already have large scale uh, on their town land, 30 of them. And uh, I, uh, we counted for, uh, in the, on this list, that there's 66 more on the books to uh, actually uh, 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 build, to be built. And 50 of the 100 and, what were they, 23 towns that are green communities, to meet that criteria, one, they could have looked at different kinds like wind generation, other kind of renewables, and as far as uh, generation, manufacturing, R&D, but 50 of those towns chose to adopt the um, solar bylaw that we actually, uh, you know, similar to the one that we drafted. So next slide. So just in response to some people, some concerns about is this needed or not, having a solar bylaw, and, and people on our committee and, and, and others feel like, well, yes, it is needed, just like the previous slide showed all the activity that's going on in the state. Um, 
and we thought that the town should be proactive and just put together what kind of regulations we think are necessary um, for when developers come to our town and say they would like to site on, on land here. And um, some people are concerned about when it says by right, does that mean that you're giving up control? Uh, and we don't think that's, that's the case because we're actually um, showing areas in town where we would like to encourage development, even though by right zoning means that they're able to do that without a special permit. Uh, just the bylaw is the last section in our, our Medfield town, uh, Medfield zoning bylaws. So it's be section 19 if it gets approved. And uh, as we already stated, it's for large scale solar photovoltaic facilities that overlay district. And uh, it's sponsored by us and the Board of Selectmen. It was uh, originally drafted by our town planner, uh, Sarah Raposa. And uh, she based it on bylaws from various towns, Sherburne, Westport, Needham, and also DOER has a model bylaw that we used. But then that was in the end of last year. We had a several meetings with the planning board. They were very great working with us. We had a public hearing that was continued a second time. So we got some input from, from especially from the, the planning board. They, were, they wanted to make sure that it was a nice type by, by law. They were concerned about uh, various impacts. So we, we worked on the draft. And uh, they did ultimately approve it. So we're really happy about that. Next slide. I just want to show you this is the zoning map, if you have ever seen this. It's in the uh, zoning bylaw. And you see that agriculture is green. Uh, the uh, purple blue is residential. Uh, business and industrial is pink. And then the one that the, uh, the, the district would be, which is an overlay district to industrial like, extensive, is that tan color. Um, next slide. And so this is it a little close, closer up. This is 27. This is West Street, so it's the area that's northwest of, of, uh, of West Street. And the wastewater treatment plant is around here by the wetlands, but in industrial extensive. And so as I had said earlier, as of right, siting means that uh, development could occur without a need for special permit, but it is subject to site plan review uh, and approval by the planning board and also needs to get a building permit. Um, and it is an overlay district in an existing district called Industrial Extensive. Next slide. Um, the zoning uh, bylaw, there are some min minimum siting requirements, uh, like you have to have a sufficient site control. You have to make sure that there is proper access to the site. It has to be safe. The developer has to have an operations and maintenance plan, uh, it, which includes just general procedures and also stormwater controls. You, uh, there's a provision for utility notification. You have to let NSTAR know the, the developer would have the intention to install this PV facility. And also, if they would like to connect to the grid, they have to have that accepted before it can go further. Um, then there's some dimension, density, and parking requirements, which is typical of a uh, siting bylaw. Uh, some, some of these setbacks are the same as an industrial extensive, uh, extensive district setbacks. Uh, the lot itself, it, the maximum coverage is 90%, not any more than that. And there we also address the height of the solar panels. The solar array, by the way, is, I think you, you all know a solar array is just a, a number of solar panels and they, uh, they're not to exceed 18 feet. And also there's concern about structures that have to do with the solar array, the panels. There could be some storage sheds, some transformers, other kinds of uh, structures, and we make sure that they're screened from, from view from any abutters or public ways. Uh, there's some design standards in the, uh, the bylaw. Lighting has to be consistent with, uh, with existing regulations. They have to be shielded and uh, full cut off, directed downward, so there's not light that goes out to um, other areas. There's the signage has to comply with the Medfield uh, sign bylaw, and we, the, but then there's one sign that you have to have emergency contact information uh, so that if there is a problem, someone will know how to get in contact with someone who's responsible for the site 24-7. And uh, there's a provision for utility connections that they should be underground, unless for some reason they need to be weighed, waived. And then uh, we spent a lot of time beefing up the safety and environmental standards. And I also want to thank Cynthia Green, who's in the audience, who's also on the Energy Committee. She worked with us a lot on uh, drafting this bylaw so that it was a, a good one that people could be behind. 
and uh, that it was well thought out. And so some of these standards included uh, areas like emergency services, wanted to make sure that the um, proponent would have an emergency response plan, work with the fire department for any training that would be needed. Uh, if there's any land, land clearing involved, that it would be limited, that the uh, impacts, any impacts would be addressed, soil erosion and habitat impacts, and that's part of the site planning review that would have to be approved by the uh, planning board. Uh, we were concerned about any kind of possible impacts on agricultural or environmentally sensitive land. Uh, we wanted to make sure that stormwater was minimized and if, if there's any uh, temperature impacts, if there's uh, the, the water becomes higher temperature for uh, for any kind of uh, runoff from the panels or whatever, we want to make sure that that is being looked at, considered, and also visual impacts. There's a lot of buffer requirements in the bylaw uh, that addresses any uh, any visual impacts. And for example, there's a screening plan. We want to make sure there isn't any kind of any, there aren't any glare issues. Um, and there's a vegetative uh, strip that's 25 feet wide, and the plantings are, plantings are to be a certain size. Uh, you have to be, make sure that it's not too high because you don't want to shade the panels. But uh, you do want to have screens. And uh, there, I do want to say that GOER put a good, to get, a good report together that was helpful uh, from ex its experience so far and all the uh, solar arrays that have been cited so far around the state. And people have concerns about uh, the environment and any other kind of impact. So it was a, it's like a kind of a Q&A document that I have available that anyone could uh, contact me and I could let you see that, uh, that, that addresses and shows some research that's been done in the different areas. And uh, there's, uh, there's provisions for noise regulations uh, and uh, security that needs to be fo followed. For example, there's a fence around the solar array so that people can't get into it. Okay. And there's provisions for monitoring and maintenance. Uh, there's language that says that the developer is to keep it in very good condition. Uh, if there's any kind of modifications, it requires approval by the planning board and in the town and their uh, removal requirements of no more than 150 days after the operation stops. It needs to be removed. We don't want it to be left on, on the land. We spent quite a bit of time talking about de and defining decommissioning well. The planning board was concerned about this, and it's not just physically removing the structures. It's also making sure if there's any waste that that gets properly disposed of, the site gets put back to the original condition or better, and that we have that so that the site is stabilized and uh, revegetated if necessary. And uh, if this wasn't, if the uh, solar array isn't operated uh, for more than six months, we would consider that being abandoned, and then you'd have to start this decommissioning process. And the uh, people were also concerned about financial security, making sure that the, whoever would come in to site a solar array in town uh, brings with them enough security to make sure that the that the um, project is decommissioned properly. And uh, so they have to have a bond uh, to cover that cost and uh, to take the, the structures out and then also to, re to uh, get the landscape back to where it was before. And it is an, a, an amount and form that's determined reasonable by the planning board. And there's even a provision in there that the developer would uh, be, which needs to pay for an expert if we think that we need one to come up with the cost of commissioning. And if, if, it's, if the proponent does not comply with these regulations, we can revoke their license and remove the installation and impose a lien to pay for it, the removal. There is a provision, like a lot of uh, siting plan uh, regulations in, uh, in the zoning bylaw, of something called a site plan review. It's quite detailed. I just wanted to show you. These are some of the things in it. You actually have to have a map that shows the features, the array, and the structures, where it's located, what, what the landscaping is going to look like. There's uh, elevation, so you can see it from different views. You'll have to have an electrical diagram that will show the, the power where it goes. Um, there's, there's, uh, we want to have a stormwater runoff evaluation. We think that's very important. And uh, the developer would have to put a, a stormwater uh, management plan together, a er uh, erosion sedimentation control plan for uh, the site for the installation. Also, one of the requirements is a photometric plan that you'd put together. So it would be for the lighting. That would be important, especially on the boundaries, to see if there's any light spilling over um, from the site. 
And uh, the process is that once the town clerk stamps an application for a solar array, uh, the town planner reviews that application for completeness within 21 days. And um, at that point, then after it's considered to be complete, the planning board has 120 days to review the application. Uh, and that would meet that other, that second criteria, criteria two that we talked about in order to be a green com community that you have to have it within a year uh, to have the review done. And, but we also have an annual reporting uh, provision in the bylaw where the proponent would have to show compliance with the bylaw and the approved site plan every year. So if we, as we talked before, it's Article 34 on the town warrant at the end of the month, April 28th, and it has to be approved by two-thirds of the voters for it to become uh, town, uh, town regulation. And the, its passage will help um, the town as we plan to develop solar energy generation on municipal sites, and um, it will help us uh, save more energy. So thank you very much. All right, we're done. <laughs> So are there any questions about this aspect? All right. Well, thank you very much for, for attending. Oh, got Fred. I just wanted to say that uh, the folks who put this together did an incredible job. If we could give them all a round of applause. And I, I wonder, as a member of the Medfield Energy Committee, if I could ask people who are, who are here if they have any feedback for us, for the committee, because we just have a few weeks to prepare for town meeting. We need a lot of votes. And uh, now that you've heard the presentations, if people have any concerns or, I mean, there are questions answered, but any suggestions about anything we need to do to prepare for the meeting? Um, at the last town meeting, we saw the presentation about the hospital. And one of the things I found really impressive about that presentation were the graphics that they used, particularly the one where they had the little scale, because that made it so clear to everyone in the audience that you'd be a total moron if you didn't vote for this. No, I mean, seriously, it was because it was 100% it was within the crew. And I think that's what maybe the presentation is lacking, because there are a lot of words, but your specifically your portion with the cost justification, if you can show that in a graphic way, I think it's much more impressive than a, a line of numbers. I just, um, just a question first, is, do we know, is the, the warrant committee and the selectmen, and is this a unanimous, like, is everybody on board with this? I'm sorry. Okay, you haven't discussed it yet. Okay, regardless, I, I guess just want to add to that because that, okay, regardless of that, there are some key players that do really good speaking at these meetings and when people hear them speak, people listen, right? So Richard DeSorger, I, I don't know. Again, I don't know how the selectmen feel. I think they're on board, but um, I would agree. Visuals, it is a no-brainer. The, the, the slides that showed the three examples makes it very clear to people. Um, has to be kind of sent home, but ha having, I mean, the state property, you know, purchase was pretty much unanimous, so anything that gets it closer to that will, will certainly help this. Um, also, I had read someplace online when I was looking into these meetings, and there was a nice job of highlighting how things are different now than the last time. This came before town meeting, and I think it would be helpful to highlight that because people are going to go, this again? What's, wh why do we want it this time? Right. So I think that, that uh, in that literature that I saw, took, that was helpful. You talked about that. In exactly. I'm sure, yes, I know you have because I read it in your stuff, but I just thought it would be helpful. So what do people think about the solar bylaw? Is that something that you would support? Or do you have any questions about it? Or? What would the, what are the downsides? Yeah, what's the downside to that? What could they be? Did you have a? Just it's a visual. I mean, I would think a virus might have a visual problem. They can see it. I would think the only problem might be a visual one that 
people wouldn't like to be looking at a solar farm. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be the major downside, I mean, otherwise. I do have one question, though. What's the average lifespan of a solar array? Do you know? <laughs> 25, 30 years. 25, 25 years. 25 years? Okay. And when you speak of 40,000 square feet, that doesn't ring a bell with me visually. Is it uh, an acre, uh, two acres, three acres? That stating, giving people something to, oh, my, my lot's an acre, so I know how many, how big that is. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. I know for a rule of thumb, we say one megawatt is one acre. So then working, working down from that, then, then 500 kilowatt, kilowatts is half an acre. So a quarter acre would be the minimum. But no. Kel Kelly, no, you want to clarify that? Yeah, no, it's 250 kW is about an acre. So that's better. So the, so the large scale 250 kW is about an acre. So that you go up. Yeah. Again, maybe a graphic which shows the, that area, the map you showed with the yellow area, mm -hmm. and sort of give a sense for, okay, how much of that space are we thinking that a ray might take up? Because I assume that it's a very small portion of that, and it's like, oh, well, gee, it's a postage stamp, so, or it's the size of a book or, you know, whatever. And do you have photos of other places that have already been set up? And so many people. <laughs> Uh, on the question of uh, the visual, just a thought that uh, we're looking at three potential sites for municipal photovoltaics, which is not exactly the same, uh, but those sites are at the corner of the uh, wastewater treatment plant, a corner that probably nobody's ever been in, um, not wooded at all. Uh, none of these sites are wooded. and. Uh, Another site is the old uh, 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 transfer station, the old dump, potent possibly, and the third is the roof of the new DPW building. So none of them necessarily are going to look any worse than they look already. These are not beautiful spots in town. Uh, there was another spot that was wooded that we were, pos that we were going to put into the mix to be possibly evaluated, uh, but we're not going to be evaluating that because it is wooded. So um, that's just a, a partial answer to the question of how are these things going to look. In those three cases, it, it's going to look better than it looked before, no matter what you do. Plus, I think the, I think the planning board shared your concern about visual, and that's why they were pretty explicit about the buffer zone, the height of any uh, shading, that the appurtenant structures had to be uh, taken care of. So yeah, I, I think people are very concerned about it. And uh, that's why we wrote a very explicit bylaw. So much setback, so much height, so much you can't go up here, you can't go down there. So people are, people are concerned about it. Well, if there are no more questions, I certainly thank you all for participating and uh, look forward to your support at town meeting. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Hi, this is Pete Peterson. You are watching Medfield.tv.